All right. Once again, good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, depending on what part of the world you're from. My name is Jim McGowan. I am the America's Marketing Manager for Raymarine Electronics, and I'm joined today by Derek Gilbert, who is our Technical Services Manager in the UK. Today, we are going to be talking radar technology. Um, before we get started, just a few housekeeping items. Uh, number one, we are recording today's webinar, and uh, my intention is to post it up on our YouTube replay channel later this afternoon, so watch for that in a few hours. So if you want to uh, give it another look or share it with somebody else who you think can use the information, please certainly do that. Um, we will have the opportunity to take some questions at the end of the webinar. One of the buttons you'll see in this Zoom webinar interface is a button marked Q&A, and it's got a couple of little uh, thought bubbles on it. If you click on the Q&A panel, you can submit your question at any time, and uh, we'll take some questions at the end. You will receive a follow-up email after the webinar is over. It'll actually give you a link to the replay, and uh, it'll also offer you the opportunity to uh, submit questions, comments, feedback, I would love to hear your thoughts and impressions on the session. Uh, let us know uh, what we did well, what we can improve on, and also give us some ideas for topics that you'd like to see in the future. We are open to suggestions. And uh, with that, we will get started. So Derek, um, let's take a look at the Raymarine radar model lineup. So we've got kind of three uh, primary groups of radars now in our 2020 lineup. We've got the uh, Magnum Open Arrays. We've got our HD color radomes. And then we have our two quantum radomes. Um, so I guess let's start with the Open Arrays, Derek. What can you tell us about the Magnum Open Arrays? OK, well, the uh, Magnum Open Arrays um, come in uh, a couple of different models. You've got the 4 kilowatt version. You've got a 12 kilowatt version. We also have a couple of different sizes of array, and we'll talk about the, uh, how important size is a bit later. Um, but we've got a, uh, a four foot or a six foot um, array that can go on top of the pedestals. Depending on the, the array and the uh, power of the pedestal, that kind of also impacts the maximum theoretical range of a radar. We'll talk about range a bit later as well. Uh, four kilowatt, uh, pedestals, you're, you're looking at around about 72 nautical miles um, as a range, whereas the 12 kilowatt could get you up to 96 miles um, as a theoretical range. The Magnums have a couple of unique features as well, which is really great. Um, there is what we call a, a beam sharpening capability, and that's, that's patented by Raymarine. So it's just unique to Raymarine. Um, and what this does is this electronically sharpens the beam. And we'll, we'll also talk about that a bit later on too. So uh, that's a really neat feature. And there's also uh, some power boost technology as well for cases where you have particularly weak targets or you're looking for something quite weak that's not giving you a good radar picture. So we'll, we'll learn a bit more about those as the, uh, the webinar goes on. Um, another really cool feature with these uh, antenna um, is that you can have dual range scanning with these. So um, from the same array and pedestal, you can actually have a split screen with two different ranges from the same antenna. Again, it's all figured out electronically and provided for the user. So um, it gives the user really a massive amount of customization and capability from these open arrays. Now the open arrays obviously are um, are pretty big. Um, they're they're heavy too, actually. They, I mean, they weigh in the like sixty to seventy pound range. For a lot of boats, they might just not be able to physically accommodate a radar that large. So we have um, we have the HD color radars, which share a lot of the same features as Magnum, don't they? Yeah, that's right. Um, and of course, as you say, they're they're a lot smaller and lighter than the the open arrays. So again, this is a consideration when you're looking to, to buy a, a, a unit for your boat. Um, size, of course, is important, but you also have to look at the practicalities of lofting 60 or 70 pounds, you know, high up on the, uh, the top hamper of the boat and what effect that might have 
um, on your stability. And also, of course, from a, a, a sleek point of view, the ray domes have a nice sleek dome um, capability or appearance. And so your, your windage in that case will also be lower as well. Uh, but they also share a lot of the features, the dual scanning. Um, the four kilowatt doesn't have quite such the range as the Magnum Open Array. That's 48 um, nautical miles. But again, we'll talk about range in a while because theoretical maximum is one thing. The practical reality in the real world is entirely different. Yeah, that's for sure. So we also have our, uh, our quantum ray domes, and they have kind of a new spin on radar. Uh, I guess no pun intended. Um, but they use uh, solid state chirp pulse compression technology rather than a traditional magnetron. So what are the, some of the things that a, mag, or excuse me, a quantum can do for us uh, because of that chirp pulse compression? OK, some of the, the immediately obvious things are that the quantum ray domes are significantly lighter. Um, when you move from a, a magnetron type of uh, antenna to a solid state, you, you lose a lot of the weight, um, which is involved with the magnetron and the various circuitry that has to be fairly heavily screened to protect it from that. So the first thing is, of course, the, the solid state gives you a, a significant saving in weight, um, which on a sailing boat, of course, can be very important up aloft. Um, the other thing as well is uh, current consumption. Um, solid state, again, is, is going to be a much lower current consumption. So those are a couple of practical realities from that point of view. The other thing, of course, is uh, quantums offer you very, very good close range performance, um, much better than you'd get from a, a, a pulsed magnetron type of um, configuration. So they, they come in very useful for um, smaller boats where you have closer in situations, um, and would give you an ideal performance in that area. And of course, Quantum has one other really, really good feature, which of course, you don't have to run a wire up the mast to get the data out of it. You've got to supply 12 volt power to it, of course. Um, but other than getting power to it, you can connect it wirelessly to your displays. So it gives you a lot more freedom with your installation. Yeah, that's actually a great feature, especially for folks that might be upgrading to out of older systems, um, not having to pull a new cable through the boat. Uh, it can, can be a big savings in uh, you know, hours of labor and cost as well. And one other feature we'll come on to a bit later as well that I just can't wait to tell you about for Quantum. Um, in the Quantum 2, you, you've got Doppler and yes. that is just a super brilliant thing. Uh, but we'll, we'll talk about that a bit later, I guess. So I think it's important to note too that, um, you know, well, of course, we'll talk a lot about new products uh, during this webinar. A lot of these radar scanners are compatible with legacy products too. So of course, everything we see here works with Axiom and the whole Axiom family. Um, but I understand we can run basically all of these scanners with our Lighthouse 2 products, the, the A series, C series, E, ES and GS. Um, so that gives them a lot of flexibility. So if you don't have a radar uh, on, on a, one of those systems and you're interested, um, that is certainly within the realm of possibility. Um, it is. The, there is one little point I, I would make though about that is that the, uh, the Doppler feature is something you'll only get with, uh, with um, Axiom. Um, rather than with some of the legacy products. But um, in all other respects, you, you know, you'll, you'll have some great performance there. Excellent. So for folks that are new to radar, let's take a look at, you know, some of the applications. So, you know, what are we going to use our radar for out on the water? I know the first thing that comes to mind is fog and, you know, any type of restricted visibility. So radar does a great job of actually seeing through fog, snow, smoke, you know, haze, sand, if you're in that area of the world where you get a lot of dust blowing around. Um, what are some other times that we can use radar, Derek? Yeah, we can use it for um, in day or night as well for collision avoidance. So um, the, the key thing, of course, is radar will often see things that you won't see um, and give you that capability on a screen in, in front of you. Of course, it'll never replace the Mark I eyeball, but where the Mark I eyeball struggles with 
uh, restricted visibility, darkness, etc., then that's where radar will give you a real benefit and help you out with that. Um, and of course, as, as we always say, the best time to practice with your radar is in a beautiful, clear, bright, sunny day with a flat calm, because then you can see exactly what the uh, radar is picking up and showing you on the screen, and you can see that with your eyes. Um, the last time you really want to, to use a radar for the very first time is in thick fog when you can hear the horn of a, uh, a large ship somewhere around you and you've got no idea where it is. That's never a good time to practice. Yeah, that's for sure. Um, yeah, having that daytime visibility when you can actually see the targets and you know look at the display, look at the horizon, look out in front of the boat and, and do those correlations. It really builds your confidence yeah. so that when you do get into some uh, nastier conditions, you understand what it is that you're looking at and you're you're prepared yeah i mean the pictures here give you a, a good cross section of typical conditions where you would want to, to use a radar uh, the bottom right picture there you you might think well it's a bit odd there's a there's some rain there uh, and rain can sometimes impede radar performance so actually it's a great idea to know when the rain's coming um, and you can set your your range um, out to one of the furthest ranges that you can use on your, your radar. Um, and you can pick up the, the approaching rain clouds, um, showers, storms, whatever, approaching you, um, so that you've got time to try and get around the edge of that storm instead of just plow your way on through it. Other yeah, things really, like, uh, yeah, sorry, go on. I was going to say, yeah, that's a, a valuable um, you know, tool is to be able to see that storm and, and plot your way around it. Or, you know, sometimes you may be looking for a freshwater washdown too. So you can see a storm on the horizon and if yeah. it doesn't look too intimidating, you can go right on through it and uh, get cleaned yeah, up. Yeah, your water maker on board might have broken down and you actually want to get uh, into a rainstorm to collect some fresh water. So yeah, it could, it could work both ways. Um, there's, there's multiple other things. I mean, if you, uh, we'll talk about this later as well, but if you're fishing, um, you might want to look out for birds. Um, I didn't mention earlier that um, bird mode is a feature of, of all these antenna. Um, where there are birds, a big flock of birds, there's likely bait fish. And where there's bait fish, probably there's some game fish there too. So there's things like that. Uh, navigation as well, a radar is a really good device for range and bearing. So if you want to triangulate your position, um, and as we all know from a navigation point of view, you never just use a single source on board for your navigation information. So you want to back that up with information about water depth and such like, but also the radar can give you a really good triangulation of the several good uh, prominent landmarks to give you that degree of confidence that you, you do know exactly where you are. Yeah, and of so course, the, the radar will show you things that aren't supposed to be there as well. The, the ocean may, may appear to be very large, but from experience, I can tell you that it's amazing how many buoys, I, I remember buoys, that's an American phrase, isn't it? How many <laughs> buoys are in front of you, but also other boats. Um, and although the ocean's a very big place and there are no specific, in the, in the deep ocean offshore, there's no specific shipping channels. It's amazing how many boats will often head towards the same spot. Um, so collision avoidance is, is always a massive consideration in these events. Yeah, and we'll definitely talk about some of the tools that are in there for collision avoidance. There's some, some pretty good ones in this system. So uh, let's kind of start with the basics and let's go to the display end of things. So what we've got up here on this slide is the radar PPI. And PPI is what they call a plan position indicator. So this is uh, an Axiom Plus display we're looking at, Lighthouse 3 operating system. Um, so let's kind of review some of the basic parts here. Um, my boat is in the middle of this display. It's actually basically that very, very small white circle right in the center. And then from the center up to the 12 o'clock position, I've got a white line there called the ship's heading marker. And then I see another blue line in there. Do you, can you tell me a little bit about that blue line, Derek, and what that one's about? Yeah, the, uh, the blue line is giving you information about your, um, your course over ground and speed over ground so that on the same display, you, you've got a bit more data to give you uh, an idea of what is happening with your visual situation around you. 
Um, I mean, these multifunction displays are great because they bring quite a lot of information together for you. And uh, what we're trying to do is give you enough information to make a, a solid and accurate decision on what you're going to do. So knowing what your course over ground, speed over ground is, you can look at the targets around the display and you'll then get some idea of what sort of a threat they might represent to you and what sort of a safe passage you, you may want to take. Um, and of course, using the ship's heading marker, you can see exactly where, as far as you're concerned, you're, you're likely to be going. Of course, course over ground is telling you where you're actually going. And where you're actually going could be more dangerous than where you thought you were going. Yeah, that's a pretty important distinction too, because it, it doesn't take a whole lot of current or wind and although the bow may be pointed in one direction, it's entirely possible the boat can be slipping uh, sideways a little bit one way or the other. And, and having the combination of both the heading marker and the cog sog vector uh, is pretty useful to identify that when it's happening. So the radar presentation we're looking at here is in what we call a head up mode. So the radar is essentially locked into the same orientation as the bow of the boat. Um, so the bow is pointing straight up towards the 12 o'clock position on the radar. As you're looking through the glass um, out over the bow of the boat, objects that are going to come down the boat's port side will run down the left side of the radar scope. Anything coming down your starboard side should be to the right of the ship's heading marker and down the right side of the scope. But I guess there's some other ways that we can display this information. What can you tell me about a north up presentation? Yeah, north, north up, um, basically, you're going to make use of your, your GPS. So the display now will be oriented so that north is at the 12 o'clock position on the screen. And that will obviously mean that your ship's heading marker will be moved around to some other point, depending on whatever heading you are currently running on. So with the north up, I guess it's pretty useful if you know, maybe you're a, a chart guy or a map guy. So you have a, a chart book. And all your charts are in north up orientation and you're cruising the coast. I suppose that makes it a handy reference in that when you look at the chart and then you look at the radar scope, the physical features of the land are going to line up a lot better that way. Yeah, that, that's exactly, exactly right. Uh, and then it does depend on how you prefer to run your navigation on board. Uh, but north up is the way a, a lot of people will use it because it gives them a very easy um, recognition of what the land features are around the boat. Uh, and of course, you've got to bear in mind when you're looking at that PPI shown on the slide there, you have so, some land showing at the sort of the, the six to eight o'clock position and a bit more land over on the starboard side showing around sort of three to four o'clock. The land that it shows is what the radar first sees. It won't show you any of the land behind the highest point. So it will show you anything that it can see straight on. But if there is much more land behind that, or you have a river or, or a, a tributary or harbor behind that higher land, you won't see that initially because the higher land blocks the radar signal from seeing it. So yeah, that's a again, very, a bit that's of a practice. Very good point too. A bit of practice of, of looking at the radar display in clear weather and looking at the land features around you will help you understand what the radar picture is beginning to tell you. Yeah, what I was uh, going to say too is um, I've done a lot of boating in South Florida and it's, what's very interesting there is you have uh, obviously a shallow sandy beach that you know slopes up onto the shore but then you know, a few hundred feet behind that, you have high-rise buildings, glass and steel, uh, you know, apartments and homes and businesses and things like that. So uh, it is important to kind of understand a little bit about the geography that you're looking at, because the edge of the land may not necessarily be the edge that you see on the radar. Mm. Uh, and another thing is, as well, you've got to remember, in some parts of the world, you have quite significant tidal differences. So the picture on a radar at low tide could well be very different from the picture on the radar at high tide. You'll see all the mud flats or sandbanks or what have you on that. That's very true. There's a feature that we'll talk about uh, in a little bit called radar chart overlay that can help a little bit with that uh, lining up the geography. We'll take a closer look at that. Yeah, that, so that's a really great the thing. Yeah. Of this axiom, um, it says that our range scale is one and a half miles 
and our range ring spacing is one half mile. So what, what do the range rings actually do for us, Derek? Okay, well, the, the range rings, you can see the pale green rings on the, the display. So those are, each of them, half a mile apart. Um, and that, again, gives you a very ready reckoner of where the targets are in relation to your boat position. Um, and as you go further out from the center of the boat, you'll see there's a, a, a much brighter ring, white ring going round uh, with gradations on it. Now that is the, the, if you like, the one and a half nautical mile range of your radar. That's telling you what the, the radar is actually looking at uh, in terms of its range. And rather helpfully, you'll see that there are every 30 degrees, you, you have an indication of that angle. So again, it's giving you a very quick ready reckoner of the bearing of those targets and the distance those targets are away from you. So something you, you might want to follow, for example, is if you're tracking along the coastline and you know you have to keep a couple of miles off off the coast, then looking at the range rings will give you an idea. There's a couple of things later on we'll talk about where you can um, make that a lot more obvious. But from a basic PPI point of view, this already is starting to give you a lot of good information about where targets are in relation to their range from you and their distance from you. So the range on the radar is adjustable and there's a bunch of different ways that we can change it. So you can see on the bottom of this Axiom Plus, We've got a plus and a minus uh, little touch area on the screen, so we can increase or decrease the range there. Um, on our systems with hybrid touch that have keypads, there's some dedicated plus and minus buttons, or you can twist the rotary controller uh, to change the range as well. Another control I wanted to point out here on Axiom on the bottom left corner right here, um, this allows us to get into the sensitivity settings, so we can get some quick access to uh, controls if we want to make manual adjustments. So down the right hand side here is our gain, uh, our rain clutter, sea clutter, color gain, and we'll talk about these in detail in a second. We also have reference mode. We can uh, have true bearings or relative, uh, sorry, true motion or relative motion on the system. And we can change that back and forth here. And we'll talk about that in detail in a second too. I did also want to show everybody um, what the Lighthouse 2 radar PPI looks like. A uh, little bit different, but the same basic information is, uh, is all there. So this is uh, an uh, E-series an e display. Uh, Lighthouse 2, it probably has a uh, Magnum or a Super HD radar hooked up to it. Um, but you can see across the top uh, on the status bar, you have indicators for the range in use. Here the radar is at three quarter mile. Uh, it is in coastal mode, head up, presentation, relative motion and the range rings are at a quarter mile spacing. Um, over here, you've got some little touch buttons to, let, to allow you to get into your manual gain, manual rain, manual sea clutter, uh, just like we could in the Axiom interface. And uh, one thing that's a little bit different in this presentation and is an option on all the radars too, is we have the center of the scope actually offset. So rather than placing the boat in the geometric center of the display, uh, we've moved it back uh, about two thirds of the distance of across the display. And what this does is it gives you a little bit more look ahead. So although the radar is technically in a three quarter mile scale here, we can see probably almost out to a full mile. And uh, so it gives us a little bit more visibility ahead, um, sacrifices some visibility behind, but especially if you're in a narrow waterway um, or you're a fast moving boat and you're not likely to be overtaken by traffic from behind, uh, this is something you can turn on that uh, sometimes is helpful. One more thing on the, uh, the PPI, let's take a look at um, a new feature that we implemented in our Lighthouse 3 systems, and that's PPI stabilization. Um, so this is pretty neat. It allows the radar PPI to smoothly turn as the heading of the boat shifts without the radar image actually having to refresh. Uh, so on some of the older systems, every time the radar sweep would pass the 12 o'clock position, you'd get maybe a little flicker for a moment and then it would redraw and repaint. Uh, the stabilized PPI gives us continuous painting and uh, smooth refresh. Um, I think there are some sensors required to make this happen though, Derek. What do you actually need to use stabilized PPI? 
Yeah, you need some sort of good quality heading information coming in there. One of the, the faster sort of 10 hertz headings. So something like our EV1, the EV2 or the, the AR200, any of those connected into the um, CTORC NG network connected to the display um, will give you that stabilization. Okay. And I know an, a little tech tip, um, when the radar sees heading present, that, uh, that major range ring, in this case, it's a one and a half mile ring uh, and it's in white. Um, but when the heading sensor is present, uh, the intermediate marks on this range ring will have bearings on it. If you don't have a heading sensor connected, you'll get the ring and you'll get the hash marks, but you won't have any numbers on it. So hmm. for anybody that has this on their boat currently, take a look and you can see uh, where you stand. Yeah, again, it's a great way of just presenting simple information to you in a way that you can quickly understand as you're underway. So what I'd like to explore next, Derek, is a little bit about uh, some radar <laughs> physics here, because I think it's important to understanding how the system works and uh, setting your expectations for what you're going to be able to see. So there is this principle out there called the radar horizon. And, and radar, much like uh, your VHF radio, and for that matter, even your eyeballs, is a line of sight device. So it can really only see things that are directly in its beam. And for the most part, it can only see to the horizon. It's kind of um, sort of constrained by the curvature of the earth, if you will. Um, but I guess there are cases when we can see things that are over the horizon. Um, what, what's going to allow us to see something at a longer range? Yeah, exactly that, Jim. Um, you, first of all, bear in mind the height of your radar antenna. As we talked earlier about a, you know, a maximum range of 96 nautical miles. Well, if you, if you use the formula here, you can see that the target height you're going to have to look at is going to be pretty tall and pretty massive to give you that reflection. So what works in our favor is the fact that most targets are above sea level um, and have some sort of reflecting capability. So whilst we may only be able to see it from deck level to the horizon, the radar, because it's mounted further up the mast, typically 12, 14 feet up, up the mast or above the deck on a, on a gantry, that has a slightly higher height and therefore the horizon is slightly further away but also the radar then is looking at another target that is also above sea level. So if you have a massive target like um, cliffs or a, a mountain, uh, a lighthouse or something like that, or a very good reflecting um, mast on a, on a large sailing ship, a large cruise liner, all those sorts of things, they all stand uh, quite a substantial distance above sea level. And that is what gives us this additional effective range. Because as, as the diagram is showing there, we're looking first at the horizon, but then across the horizon into the upper levels of whatever that target is. And you can see the white sailing boat on the diagram, that actually falls below the line that we can see from our radar antenna. If you drew a straight line from our radar antenna, just kiss the earth at the point of curvature on the horizon um, and then shoots off the other side uh, into the air, that sailing boat there, the mast in and sails reflectors is below that line. So we won't actually pick that target up. However, the mountain that's on the shore, the other side of it is sufficiently massive that we will pick that up and we'll see that. Yeah, and I, uh, I did some quick calculations using this, this equation and um, just for general idea, um, assuming that your scanner is 12 feet above the water, you know, you can expect to see a large ship, you know, something like a container ship or a tanker, a big commercial ship, probably at nine to 12 miles. Um, you know, a fishing trawler, the typical commercial fishing trawler you might see working offshore, you know, three to six miles for somebody like that. Um, another, another boat, of comparable size to most recreational boats, most of those are going to be somewhere between two and four miles. And sometimes the hull material has some impact on that. What can you tell us about hull material, Derek? Yeah, I mean, we're, we're looking at, in order to get a, a, a target or reflection back, you've obviously got to have a, a material 
that is capable of reflecting the uh, microwaves from the radar. Um, so if you have a whole material uh, that's very absorbent, something like wood or uh, a straw raft or, or um, something like that, that's going to absorb most of the radar energy and you're going to get a very weak signal back. If you have a nice vertical steel hull boat or a dense fiberglass uh, layup type boat, carbon fiber boat, that sort of thing, then you'll get a very good return on it. Um, I mean, we do start getting into the whole world of uh, stealth technology and angles, because if you have a very angular boat, um, it's possible to design those boats. Um, and in fact, the Navy designed boats with the sole intention of deflecting radar waves and so they have a, a very very small radar signal um, and of course we all know about some of the paint and coatings and materials used on stealth bombers and such like who are deliberately trying to evade radar from our point of view we're trying to make sure we want people to see us so that's where we we put things like radar reflectors up the mast we make sure that um, you know we we have wet sails is another very good reflector of radar targets but it does explain why you, in a nice clear day, you can look at two targets exactly the same distance away. One is a, a wooden sailing boat with a wooden mast and no sails up and you'll have a very weak target from them. And you'll look at a buoy that's got a, a radar reflector on it and you're getting a, a reflection off that the size of a container ship. Um, so don't be fooled into thinking that the size of the target is represented by the size on the PPI of the radar. Um, they bear no relation to each other um, other than the fact that generally speaking, larger will give you a larger target, but not always. So be, be prepared for that. Yeah, that's a great point, Derek, too, because most navigation aids you know, that are placed out there by the authorities, the, the buoys and the day marks and whatnot, they're actually augmented with reflectors or, or they're built into the, the structure of a buoy. There's, 90 degree right angle surfaces and this reflective material and tapes and things specifically designed to make them visible not only to radar but also you know to light at night so when you hit them with a searchlight um, they light right up but that same material um, enhances the radar visibility of them too yeah so so the message here is you know you want to see but also you do want to be seen too so another, another piece of equipment, we're not talking about it here, but is a, a decent radar reflector on your boat. Um, yeah, in a high traffic area, that's uh, cheap insurance. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But the, the radar, once you've learned to, to interpret the, the signals on the radar screen, you'll find that you, you get very, very quick at recognizing what the targets are that you're looking at. Um, but, but height above water is gonna be key. Um, so if you're expecting to see a, a, a semi-submerged container floating in the sea 10 miles away, it's pretty unlikely you're going to see that. Um, the same goes for floating bulks of wood and uh, a canoeist and that sort of thing. Um, and, and of course, at closer range, that's exactly where quantum comes in because it is so good at, at close range. But it depends on the height, because as you can see on the drawing here, and we'll, we'll look at that in a little while, the height of the antenna does mean that there is kind of a dead spot around your boat as well, depending on the height of antenna. So it's a bit of a compromise. The higher you have it, the longer the range, but the bigger the dead spot around the boat. And also, if you have a sailing boat and you mount the antenna really high, something else we'll come on to is you then run into a lot of effects of the boat pitching and rolling and that sort of thing so we, we'll come on to those in, in a while but the, yeah, hopefully yeah. the idea is you've got an idea of what your visible range is, is going to be yeah and I think that's a good time to bring this image in um, I found this one we'll do in research for this presentation and I actually thought it was a great way to illustrate um, the, the different ways <laughs> that radar works depending on how high up you can get it. Um, so here we've actually got three different radar scanners. There's technically there's four, it looks like the cruise ship has two of them up on its mast. But here you can see um, the radar beams are actually drawn in roughly to scale with a typical beam spread. So if you look at the top of that cruise ship and his mast up there is probably ooh, 120, 130 feet up. Um, so he's gonna have phenomenal long range capabilities 
But if you look at the bottom edge of that beam, every radar has a vertical beam spread. And most marine radars, it's 20 to 25 degrees. Um, so underneath that radar beam, it actually doesn't strike anything. So that's actually a blind spot for him. Um, sometimes you hear the, the phrase, yeah, we're going to fly under the radar and, and sneak in. Well, that's, that's kind of quite literally what you can see here. And anywhere that's uh, outside of that red gap, uh, he can't see you on radar. And uh, what a lot of big ships do, you can see he actually has a secondary radar down low mounted right on the bow. And uh, I colorized it with a blue beam. And that's to try to fill in some of that blind spot so that you can see small boats that are in close proximity. And then if you take a look at that Coast Guard cutter, uh, that's probably more typical of uh, a lot of Raymarine equipped vessels in terms of the height of the antenna. That's probably 12, 12 to 14 feet off the water there. And uh, you can see the, the beam, you know, strikes the surface of the water relatively close to the boat. So it's going to have good close in performance. Um, and it'll be able to see out to whatever the radar horizon is for that height. Yeah, I mean, another good point to remember about this as well is that whilst you may be a, a, a boat close to the ship and you can see this ship in all its full glory looming above you, just bear in mind that you're well under the radar height. You may also be underneath the bridge lookout height as well. Once you disappear under that flared bow, they, they, they've got no idea that you're there. Um, so this, this actually gives a very good representation of just why it is so dangerous to get too close to these large ships in restricted waterways. Yeah, very true. Now I know um, another factor that goes into this vertical beam width of the radar has to do with the way a boat is trimmed as it runs through the seaway. Can you tell me a little bit about that, Derek? Yeah, sure. I mean, obviously, um, with a large uh, cruise ship like that, the trim of that is not going to change significantly, or one would hope it wouldn't. Um, <laughs> that could be pretty scary for the people on board. However, much smaller boats like the Coast Guard Cutter, if he suddenly floors those throttles and decides to go um, pedal to the metal out of there, the bow is going to come shooting up in the air until he gets up on the plane and gets trimmed back down again. Now, during that time, that radar is just going to be firing right up into the air, um, and he'll probably lose most of the targets other than anything very tall. And so it depends on what his normal cruising attitude is. If he normally cruises with a bow up of, of 15 degrees or maybe even 20 degrees, um, then really you want to install that radome so that it's in, in its main cruising and operational mode, that radar beam is, is operating horizontally. So as this picture shows in the bottom left, you have like a wedge underneath the back end of the radome. And what that wedge is doing is it's tilting the beam back down. And the idea there is that when the boat is running at its normal cruising attitude, the radar has got a, a nice even beam uh, around it. You want to try and keep, if you imagine, there's a, a, the most powerful, efficient uh, point is the center of that radar beam, and that's sweeping round in a big flat plane. You want to try and keep that flat plane as horizontal and close to the, um, the water level um, orientation as you can, because that gives you the best efficiency. Um, and so on a power boat, you would tend to mount it with a wedge at the back, just angled down for your normal cruising um, speed. When you're slow down, of course, that radar is going to end up um, pointing a, lo a lot closer into the sea. But one would hope that when you're going slower, you have got a bit more time to look at that radar picture and see the targets that are around you. Speed is the great enemy in, in all things. Um, collisions at sea happen incredibly quickly, which is odd considering how much space everybody thinks they've got. Um, and so getting that radar trimmed for your normal cruising speed is, is the right way to, uh, to go about it. So how about when we put a radar on a, a sailing boat, Derek? Um, I know there's, there's tons and tons of them in your neck of the mm. woods. What, what are some special considerations there for radar on a sailboat? Yeah, again, there's, there's a number of issues there, and it depends, again, on the type of sailing. If you have people that are spending a lot of time offshore, they could be heeled over on a tack uh, for 10 hours, 20 hours, two days, three weeks, however long it takes you on that tack. Um, and so, of course, 
to get the optimum performance from the radar, you have a choice in mountings. You, you can mount them uh, on the backstay or on a, on a pole like this. We're, we're looking at this particular pole arrangement with a self gimbling uh, mounting that's in the top right picture. Um, and what that will do is as the boat is heeling over, um, that radar will settle into a flat plane, again, giving you good performance um, around the vessel as the boat is spending all that time heeled over. Of course, there are other factors you've got to bear in mind. How tall the pole is, where the pole is mounted, is the pole going to put the radar beam in the way of the, the boom uh, of the sail? Is the boat sufficiently wide that if you have the mast fairly short, on the leeward side of the boat, then you're not going to see much to, to windward. So there's a number of factors there, but the key is always keeping at the back of your mind this line of sight. If you imagine line of sight from the middle of the, the radar housing, that's the bit you're concentrating on. You want to get that in clear air. The picture on the left is showing a radar mounted up the mast on one of the spreaders. Um, depending on the rig of the boat, some radomes get mounted in front of the mast, so you have an effective blind arc caused by the, the mast right behind you. Um, and, and normally, it's safest to have that blind arc dead astern of you. But of course, depending on the rig of your boat, you, you might have a cutter rig, you might have a massive Jenica or something, and every time you tack, that's going to rip its way across the front of the radome, so you'd need to have a guard around that radome. Um, it could even be severe enough to, to rip the radome off the mast. You know, you do have to be very wary. And so in this case, they've chosen to mount the radome. Um, this is actually on a boat that I thought it was a boat alongside, but actually it's moored bow too. So this is on the front of the mast. But we do see some installations where you have the radome mounted on one side of the mast. Um, and then a, a new feature with our radars, you can have a blanking sector. So you can actually blank the bit of the radar that is firing into the mast, and it then gives you a sensible picture for the rest of it without wasting energy uh, firing into the, the mast all the time, giving you a false echo. And down below, bottom right, you, you've got a, uh, a typical mast arrangement where we've actually got a couple of radar uh, antenna mounted on here. We've got a, a pedestal and a radome mounted on this arrangement. And in some cases, you find that this whole mast arrangement can also, uh, if you like, be tacked or can be angled depending on the angle of heel um, of the boat. So there's a lot of different ways of going about it. There's no one single way. Mounting a, a radar or a radome up a mast, you've got to be wary of things like sails, ropes, halyards, etc. Um, you may want to consider having a, a guard around it to protect the radome. Um, you've got to be wary, if you are mounting an open array up a mast, um, you've got to be wary of that thing acting as a bit of a, a rope coiling machine, uh, <laughs> grabbing hold of one of your halyards or sheets and coiling it around it. That won't do it any good at all. Um, so you do need to be careful of it, of its um, what's around it and how that's going to, uh, going to affect it. Yeah, I know even in powerboat applications too, like on this image on the bottom right, you know, sometimes you might have to look into one of these mounting solutions just to accommodate all the different kinds of electronics that you might have on the cabin top. You know, this boat's got a FLIR, it's got two radars, I believe it also has a satellite TV receiver uh, on the cabin top, and, and all of those <clears> things <throat> can be potentially blind spots for the radar, or, you know, they may be things that you don't want the radar actually transmitting into, like satellite TV receiver, so. It's yeah, and that, that's, balanced. again, a very good point, Jim. I mean, we'll talk about that again in terms of um, location and people, but um, there, are, there is other sensitive electronic equipment that could be mounted on the coach roof or in the rigging. And you, again, you've got to bear in mind what's the impact of that on your GPS position, your VHF antennas, um, those sorts of things. And, and interference is becoming a more and more prevalent thing. I mean, the US Coast Guard published a, a big report about that, I think last year, about LED navigation light fittings. Um, that, that could also have an impact on the operation of your wireless radome. Um, so, you know, it, it isn't straightforward in terms of location. You just got to have a bit of thought of what's around you and recognize the fact that this is a key part of your navigation equipment on the boat that's going to make your life as a skipper much, much easier because you're going to be so much better informed of what's around you. 
So one of the things we talked about earlier, Derek, was vertical beam width and antenna height. I know every radar has a horizontal component to it as well. So what is it about radar that actually drives the horizontal beam width? Okay, that's the uh, size is always important, Jim. Um, that's the size of the, the actual antenna that is inside it. So inside your 18-inch um, radome, you'll, you'll have an antenna that's obviously governed by the diameter of the radome, uh, 18 inches or thereabouts. You've got a four-foot open array. You've got a six-foot open array. Um, and, and frankly, bigger is, is better. It, it, the, the wider the antenna, the more focused the beam can get. And then, of course, on top of that, you have our own beam sharpening uh, proprietary software that, again, further enhances that. So the, the actual width of the beam is purely a physical function determined by the, the size and the geometry of the uh, array that, that's transmitting it. Yeah, and I know in this scenario that we're looking at here, um, uh, they call this azimuth resolution. And the narrower we can make the beam, uh, basically the more detailed and the more lifelike the radar image is going to be as a result, because it can pick up really the fine nooks and crannies of the shoreline. Um, it can see between objects that are very, very close together. So in, in this situation here, we're using a radome. We've got a smaller antenna, slightly wider beam, and we've got this gated pair of buoys that we're going to pass through. Um, but as you can see, the, the beam of the antenna strikes both buoys simultaneously, which means it actually sees them as one merged target as opposed to two distinct targets. And that's what we're kind of showing here on our, uh, our simulated MFD. Now, this is a quantum mm -hmm. radar, and they actually have amazing tar target separation. And what you'd probably see in a quantum is much like you'd see on the screen here, It'll actually show you that it's two targets, but you won't really see the hole in between them. You know, we can see the edge of one and the edge yeah, of another, yeah. but they're butted right up against each other. Um, yeah, and that, and that um, it might just be like a, a couple of buoys like that, where you have a, a gated channel. It could be a fairway. In some of the Scandinavian countries, you, you have, literally, you have a fairway, and a meter outside that fairway, you, you have a rock that, that's like, six inches underneath the water but inside that fairway you're guaranteed a minimum depth um, so it is really important to be able to separate those targets you you could be offshore and you're heading towards a, a safe haven in rough weather um, the sooner you can see that that harbor entrance or the entrance to the river the the ed better it is for you in terms of making direct for it to get to safety so um, beam width is, is an important consideration for you yeah, and here's what it would look like off of an open array. And, um, and just for comparison, like the, um, the radome has about a four degree or a four and a half degree beam width. Uh, the radomes are anywhere from, or sorry, the, the open arrays are one, uh, I think it's 1.15 degrees for the six foot and 1.8 for the four foot. So they're, they're very, very narrow. So in this scenario, yeah. you can see that it, the beam passes cleanly between the buoys. So it Think of it as it swings around, it, it sees buoy number one, and then it sees the gap with no returns, and then it sees buoy number two. So it paints them as two very distinct targets on the display. Yeah, and the, and the beam sharpening, Jim, that, that brings the beam width for an open array down to less than one degree. So, yes. I mean, that, that is just fantastic. Absolutely awesome. Um, but these two buoys, they, they could easily be uh, a tug and a barge that's being towed. Um, and you want to know that there are two targets there um, rather than just one single target. Absolutely. Yeah. And that's a very common scenario. Yeah. Some, something in tow or, um, you know, gated buoys like this, or it could even just be the, the opening, you know, to a harbor and uh, mm -hmm. uh, the narrower beam width is going to allow yeah. you to see it. Uh, a lot so this, this, I mean, the, these diagrams are great. They make it very clear as to what impact beam width has on it. Um, and, it, and it's a physical property, as I said. There, there's no two ways around it. You can do things electronically, but largely size is the key. The longer the, the antenna, the more focused the beam, the narrower the beam width. Yeah, I often like to uh, kind of draw the analogy that the, the antenna is really like a, a lens, you know, a lens system mm. that focuses that microwave energy down. So. Mm. 
And of course, the, the larger antenna as well, when you're looking at other targets and other um, masses, other reflections as well, they give you a much better target resolution as well. So you get a much better shape, a much better presentation um, of the, on the PPI. That's for sure. So let's talk a little bit about how the radar can work for us. So I know our guys over there in, in your office, Derek, they put a lot of time and research into making these radars very hands-off, uh, running things in automatic mode. Um, there are manual adjustments on the system and we'll look at those in a second. But I think one of the coolest things they did is they built in some kind of usage modes. So you can look at an icon and say, yeah, that's what I'm doing. And, and it optimizes the radar for that presentation. Mm -hmm. So when, when you open the, uh, the menu on an Axiom, you'll see some icons kind of similar to this. And uh, the first one is harbor mode. And the idea behind harbor mode is we've calibrated it to reduce land-based flutter. So, you know, when you're coming through the harbor, you're in very close proximity to, you know, the seawall and the, the buildings on land. Mm -hmm. And, you know, there might be cars in a, in a car park and you know, a field of, of moored boats in a marina. Um, all of those surfaces in, in very close proximity to the radar reflect a tremendous amount of energy. And normally they drown out small targets. Uh, so with harbor mode, they're able to sort of equalize the picture. Uh, suppress those super bright returns off of the land, enhance the navigation aids, and it gives you a nice crisp picture like we're looking at here. I think this is actually Boston Harbor, um, and this was done with a uh, four-foot uh, Magnum open array radar. Mm. I guess that's the runway you can see at the uh, five o'clock position, is it? Uh, it, it is, yes. Yeah. Yep, that's the uh, airport there. So another mode um, that's pretty useful in there, you'll find this mode on all of the, uh, the Magnum, the HD, the Super HD, and the color, HD color radomes is called buoy mode. And um, we mentioned before that a lot of navigation aids are augmented with tape and they have uh, reflectors and right angles built into their structure um, that are designed to reflect energy back at a radar. Uh, buoy mode is really designed to take advantage of all of that. Uh, so if you are in conditions where maybe you're looking for a mooring ball in a, in a field or you're in thick pea soup fog and you're running up the intercoastal waterway, just going buoy to buoy to try to stay in the fairway, uh, this is a great mode to be in. Um, there is a restriction on it. it. It is only useful out to three quarters of a mile. So it's fairly short range, but that makes sense given the, the size of the targets you're looking for and probably with the, the speed you should be running at in those conditions. You're going to be going fairly slow. Uh, this is um, coastal mode. So coastal mode is basically once you're clear of the harbor, but still within sight of land, we have dropped down a little bit our suppression of land-based clutter, but it's still working there in the background. But what we start to introduce into the system is automatic sea clutter control. So we're trying to eliminate wave tops. Um, so this gives us Kind of again, again a nice balanced uh, picture. We can see land, we can see prominent landmarks and features, um, but we can also see small contacts on the water, navigation aids, other traffic, uh, objects in the water if they uh, stick up high enough for the reflect back at the radar. Um, there's one other thing that's actually kind of interesting in this image too, and I think we'll talk about it in coastal navigation, but uh, right there just to the left of the ship's heading marker uh, is actually the signature of a Raycon beacon. So if you're cruising offshore or making landfall, uh, a lot of prominent nav aids have these transponder beacons that your, your radar, when its signal hits uh, the transponder on the buoy, it returns back a Morse code signal and it shows up on the screen. That's, that's what we're looking at there. And then I've got one more for you. This is offshore mode. So think of offshore mode when you are well beyond sight of land. So you are now in blue water. Um, and what offshore mode does is it really starts to ramp up sea clutter control. So it's gonna knock down the reflections off the swells and the wave tops while still looking for solid targets out there on the water. So in this case, uh, this image was shot last summer on a boat coming back from uh, the Bahamas going over to the Florida Keys, I think is where they're headed. And this is a 24 mile range scale. And you can see where they've got a couple of ships out there in the Gulf Stream. Um, making their way northward uh, about eight to nine miles out. 
So there's some AIS symbology dropped in on top of them, but if you look real close, you can actually see there is a nice solid radar contact underneath there too. So that's offshore mode. And the key with all of these, the, the, the automated function changes a multiple number of arrangements and settings within the radar display to optimize that PPI. It's not just changing the gain or just changing one thing. There's a whole series of activities go on in terms of pulse length, et cetera, et cetera, which are being modified. And really the advice would be at any time, if you're not seeing the, the picture that you expect to see, make sure go back to auto and have a go start again from there because you can get yourself into quite a knot once you start manually altering a lot of the settings to improve the display once you once you're in manual then you've got to keep altering it manually all the time depending on the weather conditions the wave height etc etc so auto is generally a very good place to be starting from yeah, and there's a couple of um, specialty tuning modes that you'll see in there, and these will pop up depending on which radar you actually have. Um, if you have one of the compatible uh, systems that have bird mode on them, so the Magnums, the color, uh, the HD color, the Super HD radars, um, this is the one that Derek alluded to earlier that um, optimizes the system for finding fish, uh, or excuse me, finding birds, and the birds will find the fish for you. Um, but what the system does here is it goes into sort of a high gain mode. Um, it suppresses the sea clutter and wave tops. And what you're left with are flocks of birds showing up as these bluish green clouds um, on the display. So it makes it very, very easy to pick them out. And of course, the idea behind this is the, the birds are eating the bait and the game fish are eating that same bait from the other side too. So you can navigate out there and get, get right on the fish. Yeah, you can see in the sonar picture there, you can see the uh, what's going on under the water as well. Yes, yep, we got nice, uh, nice ball of bait there. So uh, these guys are having a pretty good day, it looks like. <laughs> <laughs> we, um, we did a webinar back in April. Uh, it was called Fishing Technology for Modern Anglers, and you can find it on the replay channel. And uh, in that webinar, we had a pro ambassador guest, uh, Terry Nugent, and he is a huge proponent of this feature, and he goes into some detail about using it in the waters off of Cape Cod, Massachusetts. So it's definitely worth checking out if you're interested in this. So we've looked at all these automatic modes. So let's talk a little bit about tune and tweak, Derek. Um, yeah. I showed you earlier how you can pop this up. There's a little, uh, little sensitivity control on the bottom left of the screen and it brings up this nice menu. And um, what are some of the things that we can change in here? Yeah, so for example, we, we can start changing the gain. Um, I would start off by saying whenever you're gonna change anything, don't, don't just ramp it up to maximum um, in one go. Just change it a step at a time and see what the difference is. And again, going back to the good old adage, do it on a nice clear sunny day when you can see what the effect um, of this change is. Experiment with it, just change it. You won't break it. Um, if you get to a point where you've got yourself lost, just go back and hit auto, set all to auto. Um, it'll restore everything back to where you started from and, and have another go. So for example, gain, what that's doing is turning, is modifying the uh, strength of the beam going out to the target. Um, and as you turn it up, you'll gradually find that targets will get stronger and stronger. And then you'll start to see the, the PPI will start to saturate. We call it saturating. And you'll start to see a, a yellow speckle appear over the whole of the screen as that target is saturated. Well, of course, that means that you're going to be picking up some very weak targets, but those targets are going to be lost probably in amongst all that speckle. So the idea is to turn it up till it saturates and then just back it off very slightly. And you'll then start seeing a lot of the weaker targets that are around you. Um, if you obviously turn it right down, then only the very strongest targets are going to appear and you'll have a very clear screen, but you may well miss a whole load of these wooden boats, canoes, etc, cetera, etc, cetera, that are floating around you. But it, it's a great, great thing. Have a go with it. Look and see what the boys are doing. Look and see what your land is doing, how your landscape is changing as you change the game. You can yeah, change the... Uh, sorry, Jim, go on. Oh. I was going to say, I think uh, the big takeaway here is that uh, you, you always have that all to auto button there on the bottom. Yeah. That, that will uh, get you back to, back to square one if you need to. 
you can't yeah, break definitely it. definitely uh rain again um with rain as you get a, a cloud of rain the the weather front heading towards you um generally what happens is a lot of the targets that are inside the rain get lost in amongst that rain cloud so using the the rain control you can reduce the impact of this solid front of water that's heading towards you. And you can see inside the rain cloud and pick out targets that are inside that rain cloud. Um, sea clutter, again, if you have a lot of rough waves very close to you, the radar, again, depending on its height, could well be bouncing off of those radar, those wave crests and reflecting back into you. And again, they could be masking other targets that are genuinely floating within that, that area. So by increasing the sea clutter, you'll then start to reduce the effect of the local waves and pick out targets that are hiding within that area. Uh, a useful point to note here is that if you power the unit off and back on again at the end of the day, it does reset those controls to uh, your, your standard levels. So you're not gonna go out and suddenly wonder why you're not seeing any targets locally. Colour gain, again, that's another great setting to use um, because it will adjust how the targets are presented to you. Um, obviously, the stronger the target, the deeper the red. Um, so by altering that colour gain, you'll, you'll alter the way the, the display is presented to you. Um, and, and of course, everybody is slightly different and has different preferences. So another point is when you go on somebody else's boat, never assume that they've got the radar set up um, in the same way that you would like it. Maybe go back to auto, reset all to auto, and set off again from there. Um, you should never assume what some other user has been uh, doing with your radar. Yeah, that's for sure. Yeah, there's definitely a lot of personal preference that comes from uh, experience with it, I think. Well, that's why it's good to do it on a lovely, a nice, clear, sunny day. You, you can see the targets clearly around you. You can get used to the effect of changing um, those settings on the, the appearance of the screen. Don't be afraid to experiment. So uh, it's funny, you mentioned it earlier and it is, uh, it is very strange how, despite how large the ocean is, uh, boats have this natural tendency to want to come together in the same spot. <laughs> There's plenty yeah. of room to move around, but nope, we all want to go to the same places. Uh, so to prevent you uh, from bumping into anybody else, we have some tools built into all of our radar systems. Uh, it's a system called MARPA. Uh, MARPA is a miniature automatic radar plotting aid. So it's kind of a scaled down version of what you'd find on a high seas ship radar system. Um, and it does some pretty cool things for you. So you can actually take any target on the display and it really it's a matter of just touching your finger on it and saying acquire or you can move the cursor over it, depending on what your controls are. Um, but what it does is it drops a little circle around that target, and the radar starts to analyze the motion of that target on the scope. And over the next so 30 to 60 seconds, it develops a solution that you'll see on screen in the form of a vector. And that vector represents um, that vessel's motion across the screen. It predicts the course that he is on, um, the speed that he's going at, and where he's going to be over a certain period of time. And you can actually adjust the length of the vectors to show you, you know, where people are going to be in three minutes or 12 minutes or 30 minutes. Another thing that the system can show you is something called CPA, closest point of approach. Uh, so if all things remain equal, you remain on your course and speed, he remains on his course and speed, the system will show you at what time um, that other target and track will be closest, uh, what bearing it's going to be at. Um, so it allows you to kind of evaluate the situation and decide if you need to change course, or maybe you need to contact him on the radio or make some other passing arrangements. Uh, it's, it's a great tool um, just to kind of enhance safety and situational awareness. Yeah, it avoids the good old fashioned use of uh, China graph pencils scrolling on your, uh, your multifunction display screen as well. <laughs> That's um, for sure, yeah. And, yeah, and it, it keeps, yeah, it keeps your screen nice and clear, um, but it gives you again a very quick recognition. When you look at the, the previous picture with those vectors on it, it gives you a very good picture of what's happening um, in two dimensions around you. Um, so you can make a safe decision on where your, your heading should be in order to avoid any of those targets. 
Yeah, something you'll see too, that the graphics will change colors. So uh, they'll be either red or green. Red is dangerous, green is okay. Um, you know, depending on what's happening on the system, it can also sound audible alarms and it'll flash things at you. Um, the circles will change to diamonds too. It's, uh, it's things get uh, dangerous. And there are some settings that you can adjust uh, to when you wanna be notified and what your safe allowable zone is for targets to pass through. Mm -hmm. Um, I think another thing worth mentioning too is that um, some of our radar scanners actually support a fully automated version of this. They have ARPA on them. Uh, the Magnums can do it, uh, Quantum 2 can do it, where you can actually define a guard zone or a portion of, a, of a, a circle around your boat and any target that shows up inside that zone will automatically be acquired and then tracked by the radar until it drops off mm -hmm. the scope. So. Um, that might be useful if you're uh, at anchor somewhere and you want to have your radar running just to know when boats are approaching or when, when other people are coming through or, you know, you're maybe shorthanded sailing. And uh, it's just a another way to automate some of the safety technology and uh, take some of the load off of whoever's the watch stander on duty there. Mm -hmm. Yeah, cool. I mean, you can also set alarm zones on your radar as well, just while you're at anchor or underway, just a simple alarm. And if a target comes into the alarm, whether it, it's underway or stationary, or even a piece of land, it, it'll trigger an alarm telling you that um, there's something entered your alarm target area. So we've got uh, another way that we can visualize traffic on the radar. And this is something that's exclusive to the Quantum 2, sys the Quantum 2 radar. And that is uh, Doppler uh, target processing. What can you tell me about Doppler, Derek? Yeah, Doppler is, um, you, I'm sure everybody's heard of it. It's um, the most typical example is when you hear a, a police car going past you, because that's usually what they do, um, you hear the siren, uh, the note of the siren gets, gets higher and higher as it approaches you and then gets lower and lower as it goes away. Um, and that's basically the effect of Doppler. That's the effect of the compression and then extension of the sound waves um, as they go past you. So we use a similar sort of thing with targets and we color the targets um, with red if they're coming towards you and green if they're heading away from you. We also color targets uh, like a neutral gray color um, that are not having any appreciable movement to us. They could, be, uh, they could be running in parallel to us at the same speed and same, uh, same heading. Um, but those targets also need to be watched as well. But what the Doppler does for you is it gives you an immediate view on the screen of what is the, the most apparent danger or threat to you. And on this screen, we can see there are four red targets there. Each of those need to be very carefully watched to see if they continue on their current courses. Um, one of them at least is, is on a collision course with us, probably two of them. Um, and the other two represent a significant threat to us because they're coming up from behind. It doesn't mean that they all have to be heading towards us. These are actually overtaking us and therefore could create a hazard to us if our course changed very slightly or their course changed very slightly. The green targets there, they're safe. Although we should watch them, they are currently safe because generally the direction and speed they're heading in doesn't represent any form of a threat to our current position. Yeah, and something interesting about this particular screen capture, mm. um, and I think we took this uh, on Ray Mariner uh, over in the Solent. Ray Mariner is our test boat. Um, the, uh, the mode that the radar is in there is in something called target true trails mode. So you'll notice behind all those red and green moving contacts, there's a little bit of a wake or a streak uh, behind them. It almost looks like a snail trail. <laughs> um, and what that is, is that is the historical motion of that target over the last X number of seconds. And that's something that you can configure on the system. And you can turn these trails on or off, but in this case, they're on. So we can actually see where these targets have been. So it gives us a trend uh, to where they are headed. Um, yeah, okay. And turn that, vectors on too. You're right, Jim. I mean, that trend is important because it gives us from our own point of view, our own peace of mind, statistically, he's been on that heading for a long period of time. It's pretty reasonable to assume he may well continue on it. Doesn't mean he will, but it's pretty reasonable to assume that. And this target uh, True Trails capability 
um, is something that's not just on the Doppler radars. Actually, the other radars can do it too. Uh, the Magnum and the Quantum 2 can both do this. Um, so you can turn the trails mode on. You can actually have the trail and the vector. The vector is actually that line that projects out ahead mm -hmm. of the tracked targets or the AIS contacts. And they can be shown in what they call true motion or relative motion. Um, but where this feature really, really shines is actually when you put it into true motion because it's what they call a ground referenced uh, uh, display. So we get the trail of where the target has been and, and that shows exactly where he has passed over the ground, over the surface of the earth. Um, and we can get the projection um, from the tracker or from the AIS of where he is headed uh, as well. So again, it just makes it very easy to interpret what's going on around you. So even if you don't have a Doppler radar or don't have Doppler mode enabled for whatever reason, uh, it's just another way to visualize things in motion versus things that are stationary. Yeah, again, it's all about spatial awareness, what's happening around you so you can make a safe decision um, as to whether you need to change your heading, change your position, just stay where you are and let people move around you. It, it gives you confidence that the information you're looking at and visualizing with your eyes is correct. Yeah, and you know, one more thing I noticed in this image, and I'll point it out because we talked about it earlier. Uh, this particular radar image is in Northup presentation. And there's two ways I know that. Uh, number one, it tells me down here at the bottom, it says N up, so North up. But if I look over here, my ship's heading marker is not at the 12 o'clock position. Here it's pointed to like two o'clock. Uh, so my course is like 065. Um, and then here's the cog sog indicator as well. So I got just a little, little bit of drift, uh, but uh, it was a good example of a north up radar presentation right there. Yeah, and as Jim said at the bottom of the picture there, you can see you're in coastal mode as well, which would probably sound about right. You're offshore there. Um, you're, you're about, what, about quarter of a mile offshore, I suppose. Um, and you've all, you're also in relative motion. Yes. So Derek, this is a very popular feature. Um, we've had this on our radar and chart plotter systems for a long, long time, going all the way back to the Pathfinder family. Um, what can you tell me about radar overlay? Yeah, I mean, radar overlay, again, is uh, the main point behind it is to try and demystify the, the appearance of the radar screen and what you're seeing on your radar screen. Um, Navy radar opter, operators spend years and years training and interpreting the, the information they see on a PPI. Um, and a lot of us, we, we only boat for a couple of weeks every year. Um, so by superimposing the radar picture over the chart screen, we, we get a lot more information in a much more easily understandable way. What we can see here is the, the magenta color um, is superimposed over the top of the land. So that's showing us the, when we look at the radar picture, we're looking at the magenta color being the, the radar um, returns and the cartography being the, the sort of beige color underneath that. Um, so the island is showing underneath the radar picture there. We can also see one or two targets um, afloat. There's, if we look out, um, let's see, just below the nine o'clock position, there's a small uh, little uh, patch of um, shallower water there and there's a target, could probably be a buoy just there um, being picked up on the radar. The great thing about the overlay is the chart shows us um, what technically should be there. The radar shows us what is actually there. And by looking at the two, anywhere where you can see a radar return that isn't shown on the chart screen, that's something you need to be wary of because that's an instant red flag. That could be another target we need to look out for. Um, so the radar shows us what is there. The chart is showing us what is supposed to be there. And then the merging of the two of them, the overlay of the two, gives us a very good indication with a lot more information of what's around us. And of course, if we superimposed AIS targets on this as well, you've got a really good idea of exactly what's going on around you. Yeah, another neat thing I'll point out in this side-by-side uh, -side too, if you look at the radar image on the right side, the radar is at its 12 nautical mile range scale. So those islands are, are very, very close to the center. Um, but if you look all the way out 
at that like one to two o'clock position, uh, there's some uh, weather coming in uh, out there. Weather has a very distinct characteristic on the radar display. You see, it, it looks it looks like puffy clouds, you know, uh, but it's not really like friendly puffy clouds. That's that's probably a rain squall coming in. Mm. Yeah, so again, it's giving you a lot more information. You could tie that into your weather forecast. You, you've got information on your radar screen of where you might possibly have a safe haven to go. So it, it's just giving you more options as to what to do to keep you and your crew, crew and passengers on board safe. So this is a pretty neat uh, kind of coastal scenario here, and that kind of brings us nicely to our, our last topic, and that's kind of using radar as a tool for coastal navigation. And we touched on it briefly at the beginning, um, but this screenshot is actually a pretty neat one because it brings together so many aspects of what we've talked about today. So uh, this is um, over in the Bahamas. I think this is Abaco Island, but I might have that wrong. Uh, but I know it's in the Bahamas and um, our South Florida test boat actually took this image last year at a Boston Whaler event. Um, so what you can see here is very, very nice radar overlay um, that shows us some of the very prominent features on land. And we mentioned earlier that radar is a very, very good tool for taking, especially bearings, uh, or, or sorry, not bearings, but uh, ranges, uh, measuring distances to objects. So in a pinch, if you needed to confirm the position of your boat, you can take ranges to you know, three or four prominent uh, pieces of land or fixed nav aids. You could plot those on a paper map with some dividers and come up with a very accurate position fix. Um, you can take bearings with a radar as well. Um, you gotta be a little careful when you do that, uh, just to make sure you're uh, very consistent in how you take the measurements, but, uh, but they work pretty well too. Mm. The other thing we've got going here, you can see there's actually rain out there in the distance. And we've got some offshore vessel traffic as well. Uh, we've got an AIS contact, and I think there's a little radar blip underneath him. So you can also... Yeah, yeah. Another, another point to add there as well, Jim. At the top of that, you've also got um, uh, your water depth showing. So where you can look on your chart now, you can cross-reference the actual water depth that you're reading with the depth on the chart, compensating, of course, for your tide or tidal height. Um, and that's, again, giving you even more confidence that you are actually in the position you think you're in. Yeah, it's very important, you know, especially the, the farther you, you, you travel out there, you want to start to look at where your information is coming from and what backup sources you have, you know, just to be able to confirm it. GPS is a wonderful thing, don't get me wrong, but uh, it's, it's nice to have a backup or a second opinion sometimes. <laughs> yeah, and of course, all of this goes without saying that you should be plotting your position regularly on a good old-fashioned paper chart. Because if, if your battery suddenly goes flat or your electrics go, you you got nothing. So uh, the good old traditional chart book, paper chart, and tick it off on your chart will yeah, help. Definitely, but, definitely keep it on board and, uh, and know yeah. where it is. <laughs> but the key point here is seeing that, that screen there where you've got the radar chart overlay, you've got depth in instrument information coming in. You have got a wealth of information available to you to make sure your boat is in the safe position. You've got water there and you know where you're going, what's around you. You're not going to hit anything. Um, and all of these aids all supplement the, the greatest navigation aid of all, which, of course, is your Mark I eyeball. Absolutely. Well, that brings us to the end of our presentation today. Um, just a few small housekeeping items, and then we'll take a few questions. Uh, so again, I'll remind you, um, we're using the question and answer panel uh, on the Zoom webinar here. So feel free to put some questions in there. And um, I can tell you for certain, I see that there's already 45 questions in the, in the queue, and we won't be able to get to all of them. Uh, but uh, I will have a report of all of those questions right after this is over, and I have your email address. So if you asked a question, you will get an answer. Uh, but we will take some of them, uh, some live here. Uh, but before we get to the questions, um, I just want to remind everyone that our technical support services are available uh, essentially 24 seven in one form or another. We have just recently rolled out uh, a brand new uh, support portal. You can find that at raymarine.custhelp.com. Uh, you can submit questions, you can look at FAQs, 
Um, so a wealth of information available there. Of course, we do have phone support as well uh, here in the US, Europe, and, uh, and around the world. Feel free to reach out to us. And of course, we're on all of your favorite social media platforms. So uh, if you are not a Raymarine follower, uh, please consider liking us, following us, and sharing our content. And the webinar today was recorded, and it will be up on our YouTube channel later this afternoon as part of our 2020 webinar replay uh, playlist. Um, if you like the webinar content, please feel free to subscribe to our channel. Um, tell your friends about it as well. If you know other Raymarine customers you think would benefit, we would love to have them join us for a webinar or watch our webinar replays. So let's uh, take a look at the questions. I think we can take a few of them here, Derek. I'm gonna crack them open. And I'll start with one right up at the top of the list here. Alan wrote in, he has actually uh, an A78 multifunction display and he is looking for a radar for it. I don't know what kind of boat he's got, but uh, of the items we saw here today, uh, what could Alan potentially use with this system? Uh, with an A78, he could potentially connect any of those radar antenna we've talked about. Um, with the, the quantum um, radomes, he should make sure that he's got the latest software in there. I would always go for 19.03, our, our latest software update. You can check on our website for the latest software updates for it, but um, on the A78, he, he'll be using Lighthouse 2 and he'll be able to either with the latest software use the quantum radome um, or he can connect up to any of the others through his Raynet cable. Very good. There's a couple of questions here right in a row um, around, uh, revolving around quantum and Doppler compatibility. And um, there's, there's a bunch of them. I'll just kind of consolidate them. And basically they're asking is, is the um, Doppler capability a function of Axiom hardware or is it a function of Lighthouse 3 software? And it's actually Lighthouse 3 software. So if you have one of the ES or GS series and update it to Lighthouse 3, it can run quantum with Doppler too. Hmm. Um, let's see here. So Yves writes in and he had a question about weather tracking. Uh, and basically just how, how do you get a track or how do you get a squall into track on the radar? Um, he says particularly the larger ones, but I think the process is basically the same. It really comes down to where you uh, where you choose to to, to point <laughs> point your finger to acquire it. Um, yeah, once you once you can acquire it, um, it's obviously got to be in a fairly dense patch of the uh, the squall there. Once you've acquired it, then you'll you'll start tracking it. Yeah, and when you're looking at that squall on the radar scope, yeah, try to find a kind of a prominent uh, point on it, or if there's a kind of a center where it's very strong, that, that's the place to place the tracker on it. Um, this came in from Robert, and he wants to know, does radar provide the same information as a thermal camera as to what's on the water in front of the boat? Um, no, there, there'll be quite different uh, things, um, really. The thermal camera is giving you uh, an image of um, heat, if you like, infrared radiation that is, is radiated by the object in the water. Um, whereas a, a, th a radar is using the microwave energy to bounce back off that object. So you could theoretically have a target that was very soft from a radar point of view, but you can still pick that up from a thermal point of view. That's for sure. Um, this is an interesting question that JB posed, and uh, it, it is something that's probably a little confusing to some people. On a lot of our screenshots, we have um, the radar running full screen on an MFD that's, that's wide, wide screen. Uh, so maybe the radar is at a one and a half mile range, but you can see targets to the left and right well outside of the range of the radar. And he's just kind of wondering why that is. And um, it basically has to do with that kind of presentation of the screen and the fact that we don't, um, we don't crop the radar image at all. So if there are targets that are, that are visible and they're beyond the range that you asked for, um, but we're able to render them out on the screen, we do actually show them out there at the edges. So uh, because our, our MFDs are widescreen presentation, you can see uh, farther to port and starboard than you can see uh, ahead. 
Yeah, the, the range is kind of defined. If you imagine you're in the middle of the screen, it's kind of defined by the, the largest size of the um, range ring, if you like, the largest range ring on that display. Um, so you might have three miles showing ahead, but you might easily have five miles each side of the boat. And um, I got one final question I'll take here. And again, if we didn't get to your question live, um, I will be following up with you after the webinar. Um, but this is one I don't think we talked about. Uh, Robert writes in and he says, you know, you recommend running your radar all the time to learn. Uh, but I've also heard it's not necessarily safe for passengers to do that. I have an open bow 42 foot center console. Is it safe to run the radar with passengers on the open bow? Um, so what's the story with that, Derek? What do we have to worry about in terms of people and radar? Yeah, uh, it, it's a common question. Um, and a lot of people think that because the radar is obviously using microwaves, it's like your microwave oven that you stick your chicken in it for uh, five minutes and it comes out steaming hot and cooked. Um, you, you, that's not going to happen with a recreational marine radar. Um, because of the fact that recreational marine radars are pulsed or they're frequency modulated, you, you have a fraction of the energy coming out from that radar than you do even from your mobile phone. If you put the mobile phone up to your, your ear, in most cases you'll have more radiation from your mobile phone than you would from a, uh, from a radar. Um, yeah. You may of course get reflected echoes back from those people on the boat which may interfere with your radar picture. But in terms of damage, you, you cannot get close enough um, to the radar. I believe there was a, um, there's a, a health study um, about radiation. And, and um, if you, you put your head right up against the side of the radome while it's transmitting at, at full power, um, you're still only receiving a tenth of the health authority's recommended dose. With an open array radar, you'll get belted around the head before you can get anywhere close enough. As a safety system, it knocks you out of the way. <laughs> it does, yeah, it knocks you out. It may knock you over the side of the boat, but then you can use your thermal camera to track the image and bring you back to rescue the person. Right. <laughs> yeah, I think one of the key takeaways in that, um, to understand that better too, is the fact that radar um, is a pulsed uh, microwave energy. It actually turns on and off thousands of times a second. Um, where a microwave oven, which is the thing that most people <laughs> associate us with and, and is the dangerous thing, um, a microwave oven, when it is transmitting, uh, runs continuously. And that's how it actually warms whatever's in there or whatever is in front of it. So if we, t if we could take a marine radar and run it in continuous wave transmit, then yes, it would, uh, it would, it would heat up whatever is in its path, and that would be a bad thing. Um, but these are pulse... Um, devices. So they do not have that warming effect um, mm -hmm. that causes damage to, uh, to cells. And yeah, it's a, it's a popular question and I actually see it asked on all sorts of forums as well, not just with Raymarine but with all sorts of other recreational marine radars. Um, the, the, the point is that uh, you're not going to come to any harm. Very good. Well, I think we're going to wrap it up for today. So uh, first of all, I want to thank everybody who joined us. Um, we had a great audience today. Um, lots of fantastic questions. Um, I also appreciate all the questions I got before the webinar. So uh, when you signed up, uh, it had my email address on there. So if you are joining us for future sessions, certainly feel free to ask before the webinar, because that gives me an idea of what you want to know about. Um, if you have suggestions for future topics or things you want to learn more about, uh, certainly hit me up uh, anytime. I, uh, Love that feedback. Uh, Derek, I want to thank you for taking time out of your afternoon to join us. I think, uh, I think we might even be on overtime now uh, <laughs> in the UK. Um, but thank you very much for bringing all your knowledge and expertise. And I hope we can uh, get you back for another webinar soon. It's always a pleasure, Jim. Always a pleasure. All right. Well, with that, we'll be signing off. Again, thank you for joining us. Uh, we are planning to have another webinar next week. The details will be coming out shortly on that. And it will also be a Thursday webinar. So uh, be sure to follow us on uh, social media and uh, you'll get the notification about that. Until then, we will sign off from here. Uh, have a great day, everyone. Bye-bye. Bye, everybody.